All right, so we'll get started. Uh, my name is Amr Abbas. I, I have various roles at Concordia, uh, including director of the Van Berkham Investment Manager Program, uh, where we uh, have a group of students managing a small cap fund. Uh, in the sphere of sustainability, I teach sustainable investing at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Also in the SIPC, the Sustainable Investing Professional Certification, which is offered through the John Molson Executive Center. Um, and uh, the Sustainable Investing Practicum, uh, which Francois is part of. Uh, and uh, Francois and his 10 colleagues in this program get to manage a fund uh, in collaboration with Many Life with a sustainability mandate. Uh, and then the other role I have in terms of sustainability is as a strategic advisor uh, to the Dean for sustainability. Um, and in this, uh, in this role, I uh, basically manage the sustainability ecosystem that organizes events um, and has a mandate of uh, basically disseminating knowledge, passing on knowledge on all topics related to sustainable finance, uh, including earlier this week on Thursday, we had, um, we had an event with a senator, independent senator from Ottawa uh, that's looking to, uh, to try to push through uh, a, a, an extremely ambitious bill uh, on climate finance. And uh, we had a group of experts and uh, we helped moderate this session to get input on this bill. So some exciting stuff going on in Canada and um, in particular on carbon markets. So let me introduce David uh, and Moshe. Uh, Dave, David Bauman is the director at uh, Taking Root. Uh, he ensures the integrity and robustness of Taking Root's project data. I'll let David speak more about what Taking Root does. Uh, he leads a team of data scientists and forest researchers to create science-based methodologies, metrics, and prototypes for projects on the Farm Trace program uh, platform. Uh, David has extensive experience of working with carbon and environmental data, having spent six years developing forest carbon projects with smallholder farmers and working as a senior analyst at Dunsky Consulting. So he has experience on the ground in the field uh, with carbon markets and, and their implementation. Uh, Moshe is a, uh, Lander is a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics at Concordia University. Uh, he appears regularly across Canadian media platforms uh, on a variety of economics, business, politics, and policy related topics, and is known for his entertaining and engaging contributions. In fact, yesterday I was listening to CBC and the host was talking about you, Moshe. So <laughs> you are frequently on, uh, on the media. Awesome. So, what were uh, they saying? Nice, nice things, or? Yeah, yeah. She was. Uh, it was home run. Uh, or not home run. They they changed the name now. It's called uh, Let's Go, right? Right. Uh, Sabrina. Yeah, Sabrina. Amadou. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. She she was saying nice things. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna get uh, uh, we're gonna get started talking about I think one of the most uh, interesting, exciting topics uh, in sustainable finance today, and also one of the most important uh, carbon markets, right? And this is the mechanism by which we can use the market uh, to essentially regulate or, or internalize an externality that for a long time was mispriced uh, by, by the market and ignored, which is uh, the impact of carbon emissions on climate change. And carbon markets allow for, as I said, um, the in, essentially fixing a market failure, right? Which is that uh, for, for years and years and decades, uh, companies, uh, carbon intensive companies uh, have been emitting carbon emissions that cause greenhouse, that cause uh, warming uh, through the greenhouse effect without any kind of liability or, or uh, implication uh, on, their, on their costs uh, with the exception of some jurisdictions, particularly European Union that has had a carbon price for almost 20 years now. So let me just, very broadly introduce you to what carbon markets are. And when we talk about carbon markets, um, you can think of the, the formal market or, or you know, the, the official market, and then you have the voluntary market, right? So for example, given that we are in Montreal, uh, we can talk about Quebec. So in Quebec, a number of sectors are, co are covered by uh, a carbon price or by regulation that limit their, their carbon emissions. And those companies have to uh, basically participate in auctions to buy the right to pollute. Right? That's the simplest way to put it. They, they, they buy the right to emit carbon. They have to pay for it. Right? There's, right now in Canada, 
the price on carbon is set to be $50 minimum. So any of those auctions, uh, $50 per ton emitted of carbon. Uh, so any of those auctions have to clear the, 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 the floor of $50. Now, if you've bought a number of credits to emit carbon, and let's say you have made your operations very efficient so that you have surplus credits, you don't use all your credits, this is where the carbon market comes in. You sell them on the market. It's a trading market, like any kind of commodity that is traded in the market, uh, carbon credits are also traded. Who do you sell them to? Well, you sell them to somebody who uh, is not as efficient as you, who uh, has exceeded their allowed emissions and needs to compensate. So they have to go on the market and buy additional credits in order to be able to, uh, you know, to, to uh, account for those emissions without having to pay a fine. So Quebec's market is linked with California through what's called the Western Climate Initiative. Ontario was uh, briefly part of it uh, until politics changed that. So, uh, so Ontario is no longer part of it. Uh, so that's how it works in, in, in Quebec and California. Uh, the biggest carbon market is in Europe. Uh, China also launched uh, for the first time in its history a, a carbon market across the country. Finally, after years of anticipation, it's, it's now functional in China. Uh, in Europe, as I said, it's the oldest and biggest carbon market. Um, and one thing about carbon markets is that the price differs dramatically. Right? So as I mentioned, Canada, it's about $50. In Europe, uh, the price went from five euros a ton uh, until just a few years ago, shot up finally over the last two or three years and uh, went up to over 90 euros a few weeks ago is back down to a bit 80, over 80 euros right now. Uh, so that's still you know, substantial uh, amount. Um, in Canada, the government has announced its intention to uh, raise the carbon price to $170 a ton by the end of this decade. So it's not yet codified in law, but uh, that's the plan. Uh, so those are formal uh, carbon markets, right? Where companies have to participate in order to meet their, their uh, requirements or, or the cap on their emissions. Now, what to me is also extremely interesting, maybe even more interesting, is what are called voluntary carbon markets, right? And this is where companies uh, essentially buy carbon credits in order to fulfill their, let's say, net zero pledges, uh, which a lot of companies have now gone public, uh, declaring their intention to become net zero emitters by, by 2050. Uh, and of course, in order to get there, you have to start reducing your emissions. And there are some emissions that cannot be abated, cannot be uh, eliminated. So uh, companies that are not able to eliminate all their emissions uh, will go and buy these carbon offsets. Uh, and that's why, for example, a company like Manulife went and bought a forest in Maine uh, in order to use this forest, preserve it, keep the trees from getting cut down because this is a source of uh, absorbing carbon. Um, and then they are gonna use this forest to sell carbon credits or carbon offsets, right? So, so th these are what we call voluntary carbon markets. And uh, until recently, they, they had some, there were a lot of concerns about them. I'll let, uh, I'll let Mo Mo Moshe and, and David elaborate more on that. Uh, but just to, to, to say that uh, we are at a point where there's a serious effort uh, to regulate or to, to sort of clean up some of the issues with these voluntary carbon markets. Um, and that effort is partially led by Mark Carney, who was a former Bank of Canada governor and former Bank of England governor as well. And of course, is known to be an extremely active uh, leading expert on sustainable finance. So this, this at, a, at a very high level, um, is an introduction to what carbon markets are. Um, and I'll pass it on to, um, to maybe uh, Moshe to get started. Um, are, are we are we sticking to uh, to this? Uh, so are we starting with taking root, Nick, or or or, do, or can we just continue talking about the carbon markets? Um, I think we could maybe get uh, an idea of how taking root plays into carbon markets. Okay, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll come back and um, talk. Okay, all right. So so maybe uh, you want to jump in on this, uh, David, and and talk a bit uh, more about uh, your experience and you know may, maybe tell us the interaction, like how Taking Root, what, what the role Taking Root is, uh, what, what role Taking Root plays in, in the context of carbon markets. Uh, sure. 
Thanks, Amir, uh, Nick, Moshe, the rest of the committee for inviting me. This is a real pleasure. Um, so yeah, taking root. Um, so we are a, we are a small holder forest carbon project developer, and I'll sort of dissect that for you. Um, uh, the smallholder part is that we work with we work with farmers um, in the tropics who own uh, basically small amounts of land. Uh, these are not industrial farmers. Um, they they're they're um, farming their their own land for personal use and potentially to sell a bit of their product on the market. But we're we're talking about small scale farmers. Um, what we do is we work uh, with these farmers to plant trees um, on parts of their lands that land that is underutilized. Um, those trees are then um, those trees are then are planted, and then um, the carbon in the in those trees. So when the trees grow, they sequester carbon, and the carbon is then uh, quantified and sold as a carbon offset uh, on the international uh, carbon voluntary carbon market. Um, and to be very clear, uh, the people who are buying our offsets um, from these projects are, um, again, because it's on the voluntary market, we're talking about um, entities, usually corporations, sometimes individuals, but the majority are, are corporations who are looking to reduce their carbon footprint um, uh, for ESG goals, for uh, for marketing reasons, um, even I mean, even just for simply corporate government governance um, or shareholder pressure, they're buying these carbon offsets to uh, to to reduce their footprint. Um, at the same time, um, we are not there only to plant trees. We're also there to enhance the livelihoods of the people who we work with. So the the smallholder farmers throughout the tropics. Um, and they are um, compensated through their through the use of their land, uh, the opportunity cost per se of their land, um, and uh, through the through ecosystem service payments. So if you plant a hectare of, of land in, in our in a project in Nicaragua, for example, you're going to be paid um, X amount of dollars over 10 years to ensure that those trees uh, are planted, grow and remain in the ground uh, during the lifetime of the project. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, David. So um, maybe you could elaborate a bit about uh, kind of the, the, why, why taking root does what it does and what's what's its theory of change. Sure. Um, so to, I'll give a little bit of a history on taking root. It actually is quite related to Concordia. Um, our founder, um, our, our founder, um, we have four founders. Um, one of them still works for, for the organization. His name's Khalil Baker, and he, he is a uh, um, him and the other three founders came out of Concordia. Um, they, I think this was around 2000, I want to say like around 2006, 2007, around that time period, um, they decided to start a student group that planted trees. Um, very quickly, they, um, they, uh, Khalil was able to make some contacts in Nicaragua. They went down to Nicaragua. And from there, um, we met up with a, uh, uh, the founders met met with a with a um, implementer in Nicaragua. Um, they were able to plant I don't know maybe a couple hectares that first year, and they were even selling trees. Uh, they were at that point they were just taking donations for the organization. Um, we've grown much bigger since then. We work in uh, um, I think around ten countries. Have a whole team of developers uh, um, creating a software platform around our project. Um, community. This is the the. This original project in Nicaragua um, uh, uh, is now the biggest uh, reforestation project in the country of Nicaragua, and uh, we have we have ambitions way beyond um, Nicaragua. We are we're um, we're really looking to work in all of the tropics um, using this this model. What is the model? Um, so our theory of change is 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 pretty simple. Um, that the world needs the, the world's forests need to be restored um not only for climate change purposes even though that's a that's a huge incentive but for bio, bio, biodiversity and the livelihood of people um and it, the only way that we can restore the forest is if the people who are living in those forests or around those forests can improve their livelihoods by growing trees so um really it's about providing an incentive for somebody who lives in the tropics who may have land who they own and can plant on an incentive for them to grow trees instead. And that's where um, working with us and working with other smallholder carbon forestry projects and, and receiving those payments for ecosystem services rendered, um, that's that's how we provide this incentive uh, to, to, re to restore the world's forests. 
So um, there's there's a good question that came up in the chat on, on what happens to the trees after a project ends after 10 years. Yeah, that's a really good question. That's that's a major challenge of 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 um, of this sector. N nature based solutions, they call it, is when you use nature to, to, to help sequester and capture carbon um, is, again, what happens when the payments run out. Right. Um, we have spent a lot of time thinking about this and the industry is spending a lot of time thinking about this for, for those of you who uh, who, who you might might or may not know this jargon, but the jargon that we use in the industry is called permanence. So how do we ensure that trees stay in the ground for X number of years? Um, if um, so that when I purchase a carbon offset, I can be insured um, with a high with a high certainty that that carbon offset is going to remain that it, the tree won't just be cut down. So we do it in a couple ways. Um, we work. Um, uh, we work with the standards, and I, I'm, I'll probably speak about the standards later, but we work with the standards to ensure permanence through two mechanisms. First, I want to, we want to build marketplaces around the trees um, in, in the communities that we work. Therefore, um, if we're, if we're working in a small community and we are growing, just growing woodlots there, we need to build a wood shop, right? So in 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 the community that we work in in Nicaragua, um, we've built a, we're we're building up a sort of marketplace for wood and wood products in that community, so that the farmers have a um, have an incentive or or have a mechanism for um, for uh, harvesting uh, some of the trees while leaving the leaving the um, the uh, the slower growing carbon capturing trees in the ground and they can continue to harvest trees through through different tree harvests sell them in this marketplace and therefore we actually do a there's an actual an economic shift um, that would be the first way that we we ensure this and second is is sort of a corollary and that's by planting trees on already existing agricultural land so planting trees on coffee or cacao land is what we work work in a lot um, we can ensure that those trees stay in the ground while they harvest the coffee and cacao um, uh, annually um, uh, and 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 we know that those trees won't then be then be removed at any point because they're sort of symbiotic they have a symbiotic relationship with the with the cacao and coffee products. Thank you, David. So, so Moshe, now, can you unlock the mysteries of economics for us and tell us how the market works? Uh, what what influences the cost of a single carbon credit? I mean, at the end of the day, right? It's supply and demand. That, that's like you said at the outset. You know, what you're doing is taking something that's inherently an economic bad. Nobody likes pollution. And you're turning it into an economic good. And so then it becomes the idea that whether it's the government or whether it's the private sector that's going to issue the supply of these permits, there's going to be demand for it, right? At, at some point, the idea of a net zero world is probably too severe. Um, the reality is that the world can handle some amount of carbon emissions, right? I mean, there's always been carbon emissions. We, we, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Like, there's always going to be some amount there. So, you know, the idea then is what you're trying to figure out is what is the acceptable amount of carbon that can be emitted? And then you assign a supply, you know, one to one. For every ton that's emitted, you have to have a permit. And then what's going to happen is that firms are going to realize that if they want to continue operations where they are emitting carbon as a byproduct of their production process, they need to buy this permit. And so, you know, you were talking about in Europe, how volatile that market is. It's in part because demand is extremely volatile, but it's also partly because supply is extremely volatile, right? We don't really know how much carbon the world can handle. And so if you have governments are constantly shifting the amount of permits that they're providing at any given time, you can imagine from just an intro microeconomic standpoint that if the supply curve is shifting left and right wildly and demand is shifting right and left wildly, that equilibrium price that would balance out the market is going to be extremely volatile. So, you know, I, I think that's what's going on right now. But I, I think another way that you can view this story, um, you know, from a, a business perspective is that the markets that tend to be the most efficient are the ones that are most liquid. So stock markets tend to be extremely liquid, particularly for you know high cap uh, businesses and things like that. They're, they're going to have a tremendous amount of turnover in their shares. So the carbon market where you were describing, for example, Quebec and California linking up, 
that's fantastic, but you need more liquidity within the marketplace because you're going to have single players within the market that their entry or exit is going to create this huge price volatility. And that could actually act as a deterrent for others wanting to get involved. If you get aside from the carbon market, just imagine that you have a stock, say, that's wildly gyrating, only the um, strong of stomach are going to want to participate. I guess if I don't even want to use stocks as the example, I guess the 2022 example is Bitcoin, right? This is a market whose time hasn't quite come yet, and its volatility is in part a reflection of the supply and demand dynamics are pretty similar to what's going on in the carbon market, that supply is determined by this um, you know, mathematical equation, uh, and demand is being determined by uh, mostly speculation. So at this point, you have in carbon markets a very similar sort of idea that governments are fumbling around trying to figure out how many permits should we issue, and beyond just how many to issue, how do we issue them? Do we grandfather a situation where you're currently emitting carbon? So here, here's a permit, do with it as you please. You want to keep business as usual, keep it. You want to change your operations because of shareholder pressure or because uh, you know, this is the right thing to do, or you want to take some sort of signal to your customers that you're going to take this seriously, then you can sell it on. Um, but the other option is that you can auction it off, right? You can have a government that stands and says, I have a pile of permits on my desk, um, everybody submit a bid, leave it on my desk, and I'm going to give the highest bids these permits. Um, whatever system you come up with, it's going to play favorites. Uh, you know, if you grandfather it in, the big polluters are kind of the winners that they get all of these permits for free, that if they want to change their operations, they can actually make some big money selling these things off. If you want to auction it off, uh, this could pose a problem then for probably the groups that David is representing, where you know, as smallholders, they're probably not going to be able to get involved in this type of market uh, where it's being auctioned off in much the same way that a small time investor is going to have a very difficult time finding their way into the stock market uh, without using channels like mutual funds or other ways where they can kind of group together. So, you know, the, the market is still trying to figure out what's the best way and how to get everybody involved. But I guess in kind of two minutes or less, there's the basics of the, the economics, right? Thank you, Moshe. Yeah, that's that's a very very well explained. And uh, you know, you, you mentioned uh, having uh, like an oversupply. And, uh, that's essentially what doomed the European market in its early days is that they gave gave it all away. Right, so there was a, a glut of supply and nobody wanted to buy. So uh, a supply demand imbalance. So uh, so so all of you, uh, you know, students of of uh, at JMSB, if you take Comp two twenty, and I know everyone hates Comp two twenty. Uh, but it is a useful course, so <laughs> I hope you paid attention because there's a lot to learn there. Um, so I, I want to come back to, to to what you said about liquidity. So that's one of the reasons that Quebec, for example, is struggling to have trading here in Montreal, even though we have the Montreal Exchange. Uh, if you want to trade carbon uh, credits sold by a Quebec company or bought by a Quebec company, it happens in, on, on the intercontinental exchange in, in the United States because we don't have the volume here. Um, so, but I wanted to ask you about um, how you think this is going to move forward, because we know that the, the official carbon market covers roughly 20% of global emissions, right? So with the inclusion of China, we're, we're still at only 20% of global emissions. Uh, and at the same time, you have all these massive net zero commitments uh, that have been made by, by countries and by companies, right? And, and you, you know, I think we're, we're kind of in, in, a, in a what now type of moment. Right, where the CEO is like, oh no, I, you know, I have to make a net zero commitment. Then he turns to his advisors and now what? What do I do now? Right. Uh, so, so you think this is going to create to me like massive demand for, uh, for uh, voluntary carbon markets? And you think this will reflect itself in the price going forward? Eventually. I don't think we're there quite yet. I think there's a lot of virtue signaling that's going on out of C-suites, right? That it's it's a good thing to say that we want to go to net zero, we're going to commit to net zero. And if you notice that a lot of their, their commitments are well off into the future in a way that the current CEO or the current board is not going to be the one that actually has to implement the, the you know final endpoint of getting to net zero. So th there's an element here where it's easy to say that by 2050, we'll get to net zero. Uh, that's still 30 years away. And so I don't think that they've necessarily thought through the consequences of how they're going to get access to getting to net zero. Remember too, that the other thing with net zero is it doesn't mean that you're not going to have any emissions. It's just whatever you emit is going to be offset elsewhere. So 
I, I don't think that businesses have really put a lot of thought into how they want to achieve these goals. And so when they eventually have to really focus, that's going to dictate how the markets are really going to come into play then, right? You could imagine that, let's say 2022 is the year in which uh, you know, the big corporations decide that they want to race into this marketplace. Again, it's just basic supply and demand. If there's a huge race on demand, then without an uh, accompanying increase in supply, the price of these carbon permits is going to go sky high. That's not a bad thing per se. I mean, you're really just trying to internalize that externality that's out there. Uh, but it's the type of thing that if you're a firm operating at the margin and you now need to find a way to get your hands on a credit, um, it would be prohibitively expensive. And so there's an issue then of equity within the marketplace that small firms are just not going to be able to do this. So there has to be some sort of uh, guideline or some sort of progress and process that governments are going to have to signal that, fine, we're at 20% now. How are we going to get to 25%? How are we going to get to 30%? Um, are we going to start this with the largest firms that have the capacity to make those changes? are going to have to come online by a certain deadline. And then we'll give medium-sized firms maybe an extra five years and small firms an extra 10 years. Or are we going to have it as just a free-for-all Wild West sort of approach uh, where whoever gets there first gets in at the lowest prices? The government's also going to have to signal that, fine, 20% is currently active globally. If we want to get up to 50%, is there going to be an equivalent increase in permits provided as well? Again, just intro level supply and demand, right? If demand shifts to the right, without a corresponding shift in supply, the price goes up. But if you ease the shifting of supply to the right at the same time that demand is, you can have a nice stable uh, price, or you could even have price increasing, but in a smooth way, you know, keeping in line with the uh, cost of living adjustment or with the average CPI of the five biggest economies in the world or whatever way you want to do it. So I think that there's still kind of the early days that even though Europe has been at it for 20 years or so, uh, we're still, you know, go back 20 years into the earliest days of the New York Stock Exchange. It was still pretty much an anything sorts of goes uh, situation. And it took literally centuries to get to where we are now. And we're still dealing with scandal after scandal that, you know, comes up on stock markets and things like that. So I, I don't want to be a pessimist and just say, hey, we're 200 years from getting to how to figure out carbon markets. Uh, but I, I, I think that we're seeing just merely the tip of this iceberg. And so, you know, at the at the ground level where David's operating and at, let's say, kind of the, um, you know, governmental level where I would be looking at kind of the market as a whole, I think there's so much ground that still needs to be covered that everybody's going to kind of fumble their way along and it's going to be along the way. Um, do, we, do we reach a point where we can actually salvage this thing? Or are we going to pass that point of no return where, um, we just didn't move fast enough or aggressively enough. And, and the longer you, you wait, the, the more aggressive you need to subsequently uh, bend the curve down, right? For Absolutely. And, it, and it's one of those hard things because with any political structure, right? Why do you want to take a decision today whose benefit doesn't show up for generations, right? So every politician understands that there's kind of this game theory in play here that why am I going to act now if the benefit is going to be 50 years down the line? So how about you move first and if it works for you, then I'll jump in, right? And there's a certain element, you know, where you said Quebec jumped on board first with California, Ontario was there, and then it's politics changed. And they said, we're out. I think we can all agree that Alberta is probably gonna be the last one that wants to get involved in this in Canada, because they can't see any value to their constituents in getting involved in such a program. If it's mandated to them, then fine, they'll get involved. But even there, they're gonna drag their feet. So, you know, you're gonna always have this political tension uh, at least in the beginning, where most people kind of accept that the stock market is a fact, and that's the way that it goes. Again, how long did it take for us to get to this point? How fast are we going to be able to get there? And where everybody recognizes that it's necessary for these carbon markets to exist, to internalize that externality, to address the climate issues that we're all seeing in front of us, um, everybody else is taking the approach of, will you do it first, and then you let me know. Uh, and if it looks good for you, then I'll figure out how to make it work for me. Yeah. And you have a free rider issue, of course, when, uh, like you said, with people just waiting and hanging around to see what happens. Um, I, I want to just mention, you know, to, to anyone in attendance, uh, feel free to uh, to either post the question in the chat or raise your hand if you want to uh, ask your question verbally. Um, David, let me ask you um, about some of the issues that in the past have have uh, plagued carbon uh, markets and especially voluntary, car you know, carbon offsets and so on. Uh, in the past, some of those markets have had issues with uh, 
you know, lack of credibility. And the problem, of course, is if you, uh, you know, if, you, if, if I'm going to buy a carbon credit uh, and you're selling it to me, um, how do I know not you, this is not, you know, like taking root, take root or, or, or you personally in any way, but like whoever is selling those carbon credits, how, how do I know that they're not going to go cut another forest and say, okay, we're preserving this forest, but we're, we're going to you know, quietly chop off the neighbor's forest. Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Um, yeah, historically, the, 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 especially the voluntary market and the, um, in the nature-based solution space has been uh, there's been a lot of criticism over it and, I th and there's a lot of people working really um, working long hours to try to um, to try to create a space that um, that can that can uh, that can be robust and that can really minimize any 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 criticism not only for criticism's sake but also just um, to really create high quality credits for people who are purchasing offsets to bring legitimacy to the market. Um, there's a couple things. Uh, I think one of one the 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 person who asked the question about about how long trees stay in the ground uh, that's a permanence issue. Um, again, if I buy an offset and the and the tree is cut down five years later, that offset will not ha will not have actually um, done the job of 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 sequestering carbon as. As as the product that was purchased uh, promised the 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 buyer. Um, there's also the additionality question. Um, does is that is that forest that you paid money to plant trees in would it have been planted anyways? Right. Um, this is a huge. This is a big issue not only with uh, with forestry but also with um, renewable energy. Um, we're seeing now that a lot of the offsets, uh, renewable energy offsets um, on the voluntary market that used to be. Uh, that used to be considered additional because people would invest money to actually reduce the carbon uh, intensity on the grid. They're not additional anymore because now it's actually economically cheaper to put a solar panel on, our, on a wall than to uh, build a coal plant, right? Or the equivalent amount of power. Um, and then the last thing is like, um, is leakage. Uh, if, if I pay money to plant a forest, let's say um, in Nicaragua, but then that landowner decides to plant some new trees in, in where I paid money for, but then next door he cuts down the trees to actually to um, to to sort of compensate whatever he lost in planting that forest. Um, that also means that the offset is uh, is sort of invalid. So there, there's a bunch of things that the industry is considering. Um, the, and, and and in order to prevent this, I would say there's sort of two, there's three areas in which in which the voluntary market has has tried to to overcome these challenges. And first is like data. We need lots of data to to be able to actually measure what's happening on the ground. So there's there's two things that my organization is doing. One, we're building a software for collecting um, field data, meaning every year we send technicians out in our projects to measure the trees and make sure they're still in the ground. And two, we can harness remote sensing data. This is another um, really amazing technology that's come online uh, using remote sensing data um, with the combination of machine learning or AI um, can do a great job at the auto automated monitoring of forests. Um, the second thing I would say is really like, let's keep it transparent, right? If I buy an offset, I want to be assured that um, I want I want to I want to be able to talk to the organization that that built that 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 generated that offset and actually be able to look at a map online of where that of where that forest is, right? So um, bring, building transparency, and I think um, and then third is just really like creating robust standards that are thinking about. Um, Thinking about the voluntary market um, and and that projects work through standards. There's very few projects out there that are legitimate that that a company will buy offsets from that don't grow through one of these major standards. These are these are third party um, uh, uh, um, standards slash auditors that make sure that ensure that the offsets that are being generated um, in the nature based solutions uh, um, area are are robust, legitimate, and and sort of overcome all those challenges that I spoke about before. Yeah, amazing technology is really uh, going to play an important role in this. Uh, so, okay, let's take a, a question. Uh, Jaron, is that how you pronounce your name? Jaron? Yeah, you pronounced it correct. Uh, Go ahead. So I think uh, your process is very innovative. But I would like to know, uh, you mentioned your position yourself and that territory is, is marvelous. 
and there's some type of incentive that you want to give to the people of that land. Is that like some type of trial and error or is that your strategic investment part of your business plan? And are you looking to expand to other territories and are you gonna use the same process? Yeah, great uh, question. Still oh, David, I, right? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Dude. Yeah, I, I figured that's that's probably for me. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it's definitely strategic, and it's it's a it's a basic tenet of of smallholder carbon forestry projects, um, uh, especially the the standard that we work under, which is the Plan Vivo standard, which works specifically with smallholder farmers. Um, yes, all farmers who participate in any plan vivo program um, benefit from the from the from the revenue generated from the offsets that are created meaning that they are paid um they're paid um either in kind or through um through goods such as like we we sometimes pay farmers um by purchasing them um uh agricultural products such as fertilizer um they're paid in kind or with goods um in order to participate in the project and again our theory of change is that is without um, providing an incentive for farmers to actually participate in the problem, the project, an economic incentive. Um, these long-term projects do not work. Um, therefore, yes, that is that is strategic. It's a basic tenet of our program, and it's it's something that um, that carbon product projects throughout the world uh, um, employ in order to uh, to uh, to ensure the the long longevity of the projects themselves. Thank you, David. Andrew? Um, my question is, would, um, would, uh, would a global pricing carbon s s system benefit the, the, the carbon credit market? S so that we can avoid discrepancies within countries and therefore avoid leakages? Moshe, you want to take this question? I think more liquidity is always a good thing. And, and the reality is in the case of carbon, it, it's the type of thing that crosses borders, right? So, you know, if you're going to have uh, a carbon market that exists between, say, Quebec and California, or even if we just expand it out to North America as a whole, and then we have a separate market that's operating in Europe, uh, the supply side of the story is really going to matter. There needs to be coordination between the two markets, right? So if pollution or carbon emissions in North America are going to affect Europe, uh, then the fact is that if we're supplying credits to North American firms or even individuals that want to participate, the consequences of our actions are impacting Europe's marketplace. If European countries now have to respond by altering the amount of permits that they're issuing because the carbon that's coming downwind is causing negative effects, uh, then notice that we're also impacting then uh, you know, European governments that are maybe relying on that revenue, we're affecting European firms that maybe have to come up with money to pay for these permits. And that price is now being altered based on decisions that are going on in North America. China now has a market of its own. And so their decisions are going to affect North American markets because the consequences of carbon drifting downwind. The other thing too, of course, is that without a global marketplace, remember that these carbon permits are embedded in the price that consumers are paying. So in a sense, there's kind of this stealth tax and subsidy system that could be going on. If Chinese firms are buying Chinese permits from the Chinese government, but that price is being passed along to North American customers, then we are in essence paying for the carbon emissions of Chinese firms, whether we realize it or not. If we then have a North American marketplace that is not as uh, well functioning, then the fact is that you could see that maybe North American firms are at a strategic advantage because embodied within their price is not the price of carbon in the way that it is within Chinese firms. And so you could start seeing perverse behaviors where North American consumers start buying North American made goods because the price is on the surface cheaper. When in fact it's not, it's that the North American price doesn't embed carbon pricing. So the, the way that you need to get around this is that you don't necessarily have to have one global exchange. 
but you do need to incorporate certainly the big economies or the big emitters, and you need to have some sort of transferability that if I can't get a carbon credit in the North American market, then I can go buy it in the Chinese market, I can go buy it in the European market. And so I guess kind of by way of analogy, then, since we're talking about its connection to like stock markets, you do see companies that will have dual listings. They list on the New York Stock Exchange as well as they list, say, in Frankfurt. Um, that type of situation then is that if you want to be able to buy a share and you can't find it in one marketplace, you can get it elsewhere. And so there, there certainly needs to be a lot more coordination between the, the various players here. Um, and especially if you're a, a business um, that has mobility, if you imagine that you don't have a global marketplace that's existing, there's the potential that if there's a radically different price of carbon, say in the Chinese market compared to the European market, at what point does Volkswagen say, I'm, I'm getting out of Germany, I'm going to China and I'm going to set up factory there. I mean, there's a huge fixed cost that's involved, but you could imagine that if you can save a certain amount of dollars per ton emitted, um, how does that change where they locate and how fast does that change their behavior towards a net zero situation, right? Uh, if, if they can go to China and get these permits much, much cheaper, then they're going to be that much slower to get to net zero. So th there's, there's got to be a lot more integration then between these, these various players within the market here. It doesn't have to go to the extreme of one centralized carbon market. At the end of the day, you'd like to think carbon is carbon. Uh, but th there has to be a lot more here to, to get this thing to work properly. And, and all this, and we haven't even talked about carbon border tax adjustment, which is now part of the conversation. Uh, Adnan, I want to get your question in before we wrap, wrap it up. Good thing. Thank you. Um, so I have a very quick question. So it's maybe a little bit about uh, um, David in this case. So my question was mainly about um, kind of, you know, carbon projects and, and what happened to the trees post that. I think someone did ask the question, but I want to know a little bit specifically, you know, in a country, for example, like Nicaragua, where there might be like, for example, you know, political instability, how does, um, or can you kind of mitigate the risk of, you know, illegal, legal logging or deforestation post a project kind of being done? And, um, you know, how is that mitigated on your end, maybe within uh, within your company? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I, um, and and it's it's a it's a consummate question throughout the industry, right? So um, if you ask me if these trees are going to be here in a hundred years, um, I I can give you a certain confidence. They probably won't be great. If I can give it, if you ask me about fifty years, I can give you a much better confidence, right? But at the end of the day, nothing is permanent. We we talk about the importance of permanence, but a hundred, two hundred years in the future, I think that's something that nobody would would reasonably expect. Um, climate change. Is a is a is a problem in which um, we have to worry about the local effects in the next twenty to fifty years. Hopefully, after that, we're actually talking about removing carbon from the atmosphere using industrial processes. Um, but how do we guarantee within the next fifty years that that uh, that trees are in the ground? Um, again, it's really important to bring in the technology. Um, and the in the in the in the in the funding to ensure that there's monitoring on those trees. So um, what we do is we we will be monitoring any tree that's planted now. We'll be monitoring them monitoring that tree using remote sensing for the next 50 years, right? So if if a forest is cut down, uh, there will be that remote sensing technology will let us know um, if we're unable to replace to replant those trees. Um, something called a reversal takes place and our standards body actually has a um, has what's called a risk buffer. It's essentially an, an insurance that every offset that's generated, you have to put in 20% of the offsets generated into basically an insurance uh, uh, bucket that when there are reversals, when there's deforestation, illegal logging, even if even if there's natural processes, like let's say a hurricane comes through Nicaragua and takes out a bunch of trees, um, then, then we use that that insurance uh, that insurance pool to 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 mitigate uh, that risk. Thank you, David. So, so Moshe, I, I know your your experience with the media, so you know you know the time limits. So, in thirty seconds or less, uh, how can anyone here participate in carbon markets? I think it's coming. Uh, right now, we don't really have the ability for individuals to participate beyond the type of thing that you know when you buy a plane ticket, it says, "Do you want to buy an offsetting credit?" Um, this is kind of on a firm-to-firm -firm basis, again, based on virtue signaling. 
beyond that, the, the next evolution is as the markets become deeper, the same way that you can buy your way into the stock market, either directly or through mutual funds. I think that's the next evolution that we're going to see that these types of markets evolve in a way that consumers can participate in it, uh, whether on the supply side or, or the demand side. Wow, almost exactly 30 seconds. You, you, you are a pro. <laughs> Well, th thank you both. I think uh, this was a lot of fun. I, I could go for another couple of hours, uh, but uh, we are up uh, on, at four o'clock for time. So uh, thank you both. And uh, thank you, Nick, for inviting us. Emma, I invite you to our networking cocktail where you can absolutely continue the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Uh, very, very young and unexplored topic here. And I know as business students, we're always looking for concepts like this to take a deeper look into. And so thank you for shedding your, uh, uh, shedding some light on it and sharing your knowledge. And um, yeah, uh, big round of applause. This was really interesting and uh, yeah. Amazing. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks so much, fun. Nick. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Guys.